I'm Bruce Christensen, and I'm an Adventist inventor. I worked for Clark Equipment Company for 34 years, and part of that time I was in design work, and resulted in inventing certain uh, features of our machines. Uh, in particular, I was working with bulldozers, rubber tired bulldozers, and I uh, needed to, I worked under supervision of my boss and designed the uh, early bulldozers for our, our company. To do that, there were various features that were needed uh, that either hadn't existed or been shown to exist. And uh, I think I developed ways to accommodate the needs and provide the kind of thing we needed because this a rubber tired bulldozer was a little different. Most in that day were track driven uh, bulldozers. And so this was kind of a new thing. Uh, it was a takeoff on the front end loaders that we were already, had already been designed and made. So I had a basic machine, but I had to change it to be a bulldozer instead of a front end loader. So as a result, I uh, spent uh, uh, several years in that process working on various machines and uh, de developed uh, six patents to uh, cover the designs that we came up with. Some were mine individually and some were joint uh, patents. Uh, f a few words first as to what a patent is. It's a document from the government that uh, gives you the right to produce this product and sell it and that nobody else has the same right. So it keeps it to be an exclusive thing, which was a good deal for a new businesses or a new product and uh, encouraged uh, inventiveness as well. The process involved the designer having a need and spending the time to come up with a solution and then making it practical by making necessary drawings and calculations and so forth. So it's fairly likely to be able to work. And then you developed a description of this, a written description, which then was turned over to our legal staff who had to then investigate it through the government agencies that nobody else had done the same thing. So a patent assures you that your product is an individual item. And that, that license is only for 17 years. After 17 years, uh, anyone else can copy the patent and go ahead and use it. So it gives you a start in business without having to fight off the other people. But using the word fight, they say the patent is really nothing more than a license to fight. Because, uh, as I'll show you in a minute, some of these patents are very narrow and other people then figure out ways to get around them, which is how I did one of my patents. Others were more original than that. But anyway, it's an, you come up with an idea that nobody else seems to have come up with. Not that it's maybe too uh, elaborate or anything. I worked for Clark Equipment Company and received my first patent in 1957. That patent was a positioning system for front end loaders because at that time the company was just starting in the construction machinery business and had to design their own front end loader to avoid the competition or to outdo the competition if necessary or possible. So uh, there was uh, quite a bit of work that we did in terms of how do you position that bucket to automatically be in the right position when you come to loading a, 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 a truck or, or catching a load to move to somewhere else. So uh, we tried arms, different kind of arm configurations. Uh, we tried uh, other ways. And so when I saw that, I saw, well, I think I can do the same thing with hydraulics which is what I did and uh, developed a way that the hydraulics could, could control the 
the blade or the bucket and do the job as well. So the patent was granted. The patent process is kind of lengthy because that one was granted in 57, but it was filed in 53. Uh, it took about four years to go through the process, and it seemed to be that way in general. Our concern engineer-wise was we just went ahead and uh, designed and built and whatever. Uh, the legal people were to keep us out of trouble and, and help us uh, through the process. But we had to first come up with the idea. Secondly, we had to then document that idea. Uh, not necessarily have actually built it, but that could help too. Uh, but we had to document it and send this to the legal people. They in turn would uh, go through the patent office and search all of the uh, patents to see if there was any one that was similar or same that uh, either had an effect or relationship that this was an improvement over that one or they actually had duplicated it. Uh, so the reason for the time is they of course were a small department of the company and, and uh, would work on it and it could take some time. Because also when you look at the patent, there had to be special drawings made of the device. These special drawings were done to uh, the patent office criteria, not our conventional designer criteria. And then they also then described the, the, the uh, function of the patent and described the features and how it worked and so forth. And then they would cover us as much as possible by describing other alternative ways to do that same thing uh, within the realm of the patent. So it was a lengthy description process of which the engineer and myself uh, that did the design had to read it and understand what they were describing, which was not always easy, but it was a process that was necessary and it was finally accomplished and uh, you, you got a patent and uh, went into production. Uh, some of these uh, ended up as patents uh, to put away in the uh, storehouse somewhere because you didn't need it right then. We already had some other solutions. And so and even in some cases, the patent never got used. So uh, some of these uh, once I had designed it and documented it, I moved on to other jobs and didn't worry about it. And when they came through with their papers, I would check them out and send them back and go back and forth until the documentation was taken care of. And you could move on to maybe a new patent or new whatever was needed. The second patent, because I was working at first in front end loaders, uh, this was a couple years later now or so, apparently I was working on uh, changing or turning a front end loader into a rubber tired bulldozer, which was a kind of new concept in those days. In fact, many of the, re of the um, workers in the industry kind of laughed at us and said, you know, a bulldozer can't work on rubber tires. It can only work if you got a, a track. And that, of course, was what our competition was doing. Uh, others had already done some work, and, but we still needed to do something better. And that was finally done with our uh, front end loaders. They hired actually people from other companies, and I worked for them and uh, did this process. But then when we wanted to turn it into a bulldozer, we had a bulldozer man who had been hired and he was my boss and we worked on that together. And a bulldozer is a little different arrangement with a front end loader. You have to just run the scoop into the pile and turn it back and dump it into a truck or whatever and bring it back to the ground. And no, the angle particularly didn't matter other than, it. and so you could work the geometry with uh, linkage uh, designs. But uh, I was enamored with the idea of hydraulics and uh, that's what I had used for the 
front end loader, so I thought with the dozer, it needs a little more control, a little better control, and we would do it with a single cylinder in the middle. We also went for the idea of that the dozer arms ending on the blade were somewhat flexible in their connection uh, in order to go up and down and so forth. But that we put a cylinder on the arm to the top of the blade and could control the blade that way. But we actually uh, made it so it warped, purposely warped the, the uh, structure relationships enough to get some angle on the blade that could make it work better and do the regular job that they usually got from that type of machine. That, uh, that, uh, that patent was issued in 1958. Uh, after that, I, I was doing design work in general and keeping up with changes that the products that we put in the machine made because we didn't make the engine, we didn't make the transmission nor the axles. But that was part of why we did it with Clark because they were known for making heavy duty transmissions and axles. All we had to do was to work out the details of how we were gonna clamp that to a frame and make it all work. So that was kind of what I was doing most of the time there. But then they, they made larger and larger versions. The first version was very small machine. Uh, then the next one was a little larger and so forth. And we finally came out with a series. Uh, and they needed a large uh, rubber tire dozer that could work in the coal mines, uh, open, coal, open pit coal mines and other such locations uh, doing heavy work of that kind. And so it came out with this machine that I worked on. It was around a 100,000 pound machine and uh, a lot of fun to, to design it because it was uh, the first one that in a sense none of my bosses had really worked on and we were all working in uh, unusual territory. Uh, one of the things about bulldozers, uh, well it's important with the front end loaders, but, but bulldozers in particular you want lots of weight on the ground. And so if you could get any way to get a little more weight on it was good. Whereas a front end loader only needed a weight on the back in order to counteract the load they were picking up. Whereas the bulldozer was not picking up a load, but it was pushing a load and needed traction. And so uh, the uh, design that I worked on uh, was that way. And then they said, now we need more weight on the ground. And that's a simple solution, you think, but you can, take slabs of steel and put them on and take them off and so forth. But the weight had other restrictions because the bulldozers had to be moved. And when you moved them from one place to the other, they usually were taken on a uh, trailer of some sort. And uh, they could only go with so much weight over the roads. This machine weighed, like I said, around 100,000 pounds. And uh, they, well, that was the finished weight, but uh, they wanted, uh, I forget now how much weight it was, but quite a bit more on there. So the frame was a solid steel plate, two inches thick, which gave nice weight, obviously. It was more than, you didn't have to worry about the stresses particularly because it was plenty strong. But across the front, uh, there was open space where we could put a weight. But, uh, to how, how are you going to fasten it on and make it so it's easily removable? So I made up a design that in effect put a tongue on the front of the machine like a uh, sticking out, uh, I think it was a two inch plate like was sticking out. And then you would slide a cast iron plate, I mean a, a bulk piece of cast iron shaped to f that this uh, tongue could fit into a groove in that casting. And then there would be a hole cast in that casting so that you could put a bolt through, 
a big one no less, uh, to keep it from hopping off from, and vibrating out of place. So it was simple to take off or to put on. You just get a crane to lift the load and slide it on and put the bolt through and, and it would be safe from vibrations and that kind of thing. So the design was for that the patent was, you might say, a design patent rather than a functional patent. But uh, that one got into business and uh, was used extensively. The, uh, that patent was given to me in 1962. Uh, later in 1962, I came up with another patent. They wanted to, because these big machines were good for packing earth, and especially if you had metal wheels. And so competition had come up with metal wheels to put on in place of rubber tires, rim and stuff. So I designed the wheel for this machine uh, with pads and open spaces between them and so forth that you, the machine would work and pack the, the dirt down as it moved. However, uh, so we, we built a machine, well, we built a set of wheels. And we put them on the machine and they worked. And so we sent it out to a job site, actually it was a, an earthen dam on California. And uh, let it run there a bit. And our competition saw that. And they said, no, you can't do that. Those wheels are a copy of what we make. So I was faced with the dilemma, I'd done all the work to make the wheels to fit and do the job, and they would do the job, but it broke a patent, or him, him, him uh, I can't think of the word. Anyway, it was not permissible because it, it took, it had already been patented. So it's an example of how something that's already done, you, you can't redo. A patent is meant to be original. Nobody else has done it the, that way. They may have done something like it, but not that way. So I got to thinking about it and looking at my wheel and so forth. I had a nice looking wheel, but it wasn't going to work. They, in fact, made us take those wheels off and cut them up under their supervision in order to be sure that we did not keep infringing on their patent. So I read their patent and so forth, and in their patent they mentioned that this gave a nice even pressure on the dirt and so forth. And I said, well, we don't really want an even, we're wanting a pounding effect. They have uh, that type of thing for handwork, so why can't we do that with the wheel? And I says, well, to myself I thought, if I change the wheel pattern so that there's a space between the pads that is unequally spaced, then it'll be unequal like pressure on the ground. And their patents all said equal pressure. So we were able to get around their patents by designing purposely an unequal pressure. And uh, I don't know if that ever really went into production because we were coming to kind of a rundown in our company. But it was an illustration of how you can just make a modification to a patent and now you get a patent. So I got that patent uh, to go with that and in uh, 62 and 63, uh, well, the 63 was the compactor wheel, but uh, also you had to have cleaners to clean out the, the, between the pads as the wheel rotated, it'd get clogged up with dirt and then it wouldn't be doing anything. And so I came up with a design for that, and uh, that uh, was available. But th those six patents were what I was responsible for. I was moved then to other duties. Uh, I was promoted to take care of other things. And so the design work was done by others. But it, the design, uh, the invention process was interesting. And the extent to which you had to go through to prove the patent and make it worthwhile. The interesting thing was, it's an incentive to the designer, they would give you an award. But remember that as a worker in the company, an employee, uh, you sign papers when you 
were employed, at least in the engineering department, that any patents would be the company's patent. You had to assign it to that, which I had to do for these six. But the company was in uh, wanting to be fair and be nice and give you some reward. So we would get a brand new dollar bill for every patent. That was our, we did not specify a value, so we were stuck with what they did. <laughs> they made a point that it was a brand new dollar bill, very nice. And uh, so I, at those days, you could, I could take my family out for ice cream on that. Nowadays, you can't hardly get enough for one cone that way. <laughs> but uh, the value of things were that way. So we didn't complain, we had a job. We had been recognized, and they did have a, uh, a dinner at scheduled time in which they acknowledged the winners and gave us a trophy and so forth. So it wasn't without some applause, but it was an interesting process.